In 1983, the team of the panel game My Music was invited to record a programme for the Hong Kong Arts Festival. And while they were out in Hong Kong, Frank Muir was somewhat reluctantly persuaded to present a one-man show. Though worried beforehand about filling a time slot longer than 20 minutes, in the event he spoke effortlessly for an hour and three quarters. That has now been edited into two half hours, which have never before been heard on the radio. So, as part of our continuing tribute, here's the first part of Frank Muir in Hong Kong, The Hunt for the Wild Duck. Good evening. The hunt for the wild guffaw. <clears throat> Any study of comedy must begin from the intellectual but slave-based society of ancient Greece, tempered by the more rigorous military disciplines of the ancient Romans. One must always also bear in mind the need in the Mediterranean and later more Western communities for comedy and, and what, what it does to... There's a good bit here somewhere. God. I, I had to. There was, um, there was a prominent English Catholic who went to Rome. Actually, he was a convert. He used to live two or three doors away from where I lived, and in fact still live, in the village of Thorpe, in the poor quarter of Surrey. <laughs> we march with stains. The Hudsons was their name, and um, they were prominent Church of England. Actually, Mrs. Hudson was rabid Church of England, if that isn't a contradiction in terms. And, and they, they had two children. They had Rob, who was a boy, kind of eight or nine or something, and they had this, this Moppet, who was six or seven. And uh, Elizabeth Hudson was dead keen on sending the Moppet to um, a church in the school. But I, perhaps you don't know Thorpe all that well. <laughs> but, but there wasn't a day school for a child of that age. And perforce, poor Elizabeth had to send the Moppet to uh, a Catholic day convent. You drive from Thorpe, Virginia Water, <laughs> the Wheat Chief, turn left on the main road with difficulty, Right immediately, chung chung chung, and there's a sign, the two signs actually, um, hand drawn. And, once the, and I, this is absolutely true, and I have a photograph to prove it. There are two hand signs, the top one says, Convent of the Sacred Heart, and the second one says, Stud Farm. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot invent that sort of thing, it's, there it is. And the Muppet was sent to the, um, to this Catholic day school <laughs> and came back for tea and Liz Hudson watched the Muppet worriedly to see what papist influences she'd acquired in her first day and the child displayed none no disquieting symptoms and sat down to her tea and uh, made the sign of the cross and the mother said why is it Why did you do that? And she said, oh, the nuns uh, told us to do it. Did they explain why? What it means? And the Muppet said, I think it's something to do with second helpings. <laughs> now, this, this fine encapsulation of Catholicism <clears throat> So impressed her elder brother 
that he changed his religion there and then. <laughs> Halfway through a chocolate digestive and marmite biscuit. So, irrelevant really, we pick him up at the, in the Vatican. He's now a prominent British Catholic and he's got himself a guide called, I don't know, Leonardo da Vinci. No relation, of course, but just a name. And Leonardo is showing the Englishman around and they're walking along the Vatican corridors and suddenly there's sound of terrific laughter in the corner and there's a scarlet-clad figure talking and he's surrounded by black-clad figures, all of whom are laughing. Really deep laughter. The Englishman says to Leonardo, how interesting, who is he? Who is the scarlet-clad figure surrounded by the black care of one's laughing? And Leonardo says, oh, he's, uh, he's a Cardinal Orsini. So, you know, he's, he's the wittiest man in the Vatican. And the Englishman said, stay here. I'd rather like to hear him talk. So Leonardo watched the Englishman go and join the group, and sure enough, after a moment or two, the English Catholic was laughing just as much as the others. And he rejoined Leonardo. Yes, he said, you're quite right. He, by golly, he's funny. <laughs> what, what a funny man. Witty too, not just funny, but witty. He speaks English. He said, no, 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 he's talking in his native tongue. You speak Italian, senor. He said, no, no, not a word. And, ah, you know, he's funny and he's witty. And the prominent English Catholic said, I trusted him. <laughs> <laughs> the only... Why I uh, thought I'd mention that <laughs> was I wonder whether tonight, just a little of that self-same trust could be... Uh, uh, I don't know why I agreed to do this. I honestly don't. I, I know why I was asked, of course, because, um, you know, it's, it's pretty well understood that I am to uh, arts festivals like Dame Margot Fontaine is to non-ferrous oxyacetylene welding. <laughs> I mean, one, one hasn't had much experience, in fact, no, no experience at all. This is the fir first time, as we'll become increasingly... I haven't attempted anything like this before. Well, but one doesn't, because I've been all my life a writer. Well, one isn't as a writer, as a, not as a sort of comedy writer, as a new invention. Uh, when Dennis Norden and I started writing humour 35 years ago, we wouldn't have been asked to address an envelope. <laughs> but, it's, but it's curious how writers have now become accepted as, as living, breathing creatures in the main obscene and not heard, but occasionally <laughs> permitted to do things, and sometimes, as to, tonight, asked to do things. And it's very curious how, over the last 35 years, if I look back, that the position of pairs of writers like Galton and Simpson and Muir and Norton and everything, the position of the pair of writers in the world of entertainment is analogous to the position of female bosoms in the world of fashion, in that it, go, it goes in fashions. And sometimes the two of us <laughs> are crammed out of sight. And everybody pretends we don't exist at all. You know. <laughs> and then the fashion changes, and we're thrust into a kind of false prominence. <laughs> But very rarely are we, as tonight, fully exposed to the public in a Hong Kong civic theatre. <laughs> Even more rarely, I suppose, only one of the two. <laughs> I know... 
I know why I was asked. Uh, why I accepted is another matter. I accepted because I was asked very flatteringly. You see, these things were arranged a long time ahead. They didn't just happen overnight. There's a tremendous lot of organisation behind them. There's all the hotel bookings and the airline bookings and availabilities of the people. And this must have been spring of last year. And I was asked, not by letter, because the letter's happily, very easily, easy to turn down. But it wasn't that, you see. It was a phone call. And, of course, a phone call from a long way away. And it wasn't as simple, it wasn't just the dialing you can do now, because I was sitting on an island in Corsica. Sitting on, on Corsica, in fact. <laughs> Not an easy place to telephone, I might say. I'd taken a villa there in, in uh, April, May, June for three months to finish a novel. I'm a terribly slow reader. And I was sitting... <laughs> There's that awful alien phone ring. Me, me, and I picked up the phone, and there was all this. Was um, a And eventually, this nice, clear girl's voice said, "This is the Hong Kong Festival Office. Mr. Keith Statham would very much like to speak to you." Will you accept a transferred charge call? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> How could one refuse? <laughs> but I, you know, Keith was saying, you know, sort of, please do something. I said, well, I, nothing I can do, you know. I, 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 was, he said, well, d d treat it as a kind of after-dinner speech. And, and my blood froze, hackles rose. There's anything I hate, it's after dinner speaking. It's a terrible thing. You, you have a dinner, and you, you, you get in, and you, you find your table with the... And the other seven people look a right load of boring rubbish. <laughs> and, and the food comes, and you have a couple or five glasses of wine. And suddenly they're not boring at all. They're really quite fun. And you're, you're just getting into it, and there's... My laws, ladies and gentlemen, and it's awful stuff, you know. That, of, I'm reminded of a story of the, the, our Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, 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 and it's, <laughs> the cigar going, and it's 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 all it's all a masculine thing. I mean, women. Well, women do it a little, don't they? I mean, you get uh, lady authors and things. You, you get lady authors literary luncheon where the female of the speeches is more deadly than the meal. <laughs> I, <coughs> I quote... But generally, generally speaking, it's a male thing, because it's this masculine masochism. Men can stand pain better than women, <laughs> and, and at times quite enjoy it. And there, is a, there is occasionally a theory that Men can't stand pain as well as women, but I think they can. And there was an occasion some years ago when it was proved to me that men could stand pain better than women. We were doing a television show in Shepherd's Bush, in the Shepherd's Bush Empire, which was a, a marvellous place of entertainment and then was converted into a BBC television studio. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we were doing a... We were doing a musical show with Jimmy Edwards, and during rehearsal, the, the boom operator had a bit of trouble. There's a bit of ironmongery. If you can imagine that somebody had filleted a giraffe <laughs> and retained the bone structure. It's, it's a kind of metallic contrivance, very much like a giraffe with the straddled legs, with a long neck which is telescopic, uh, with a microphone dangling at the end, which follows the actors and everybody around the set. And on commercial television is frequently just in shot. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a boom operator 
working, and he falls off his boom. And now he's about eight feet up, you know, so it's, it's quite a drop. And he put his shoulder out. So we rang Matron, and Matron finished her lunch, and she signed the chitty, and his name is Mr. Tozer. He wore those technician's tweed jackets, which are a quarter of an inch thick, <laughs> with bits in them. You know? was, so they're woven from marmalade. You know, they, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this is irrelevant. <clears throat> Mr. Tozer was, was semi-rushed in an inexpensive BBC car to Harley Street, and the specialist caused Mr. Tozer to... Uh, lie supine in front of his heavy desk and caused Mr. Tozer to raise the arm in question with many a squeal. And he put his foot in Mr. Tozer's armpit and braced Mr. Tozer's arm against his heavy and expensive desk um, with what can only be described as a gondolier-like action. <laughs> There was, a, there was a crack. Ah! Gone. Gone back. No problem at all. So they helped the grinning Mr. Tozer out, and back they went to, to, to work. So, a little while afterwards, you know, when one always thinks that because one of these surgeon chaps or consultant is 14 Harley Street, that it, the whole house belongs to him. But not a bit of it. There's 130 of them in there. <laughs> 200,000 a year. It's a rookery. <laughs> our Mr. <laughs> our bone chap, having restored Mr. Tozer, strolled along the corridor, waiting for his next patient, to the machine at the end, the caviar machine or something. And, <laughs> and he was joined by this lady gynaecologist who said to him, the fuss your men make over a bit of pain. He said, I'm, I'm three consulting rooms away, and I heard that yelp from that man. Just a little thing like a uh, dislocated arm. She said, I've got a patient of mine, a slim girl, gave birth to a boy, £10.12, without a whimper. And the bone chap said, well, it's maybe so, but you try shoving it back. <laughs> <laughs> that... That... That, that sounds rather feminist. <laughs> it isn't actually, it's not. It's just... That story, which might well be true, was told to me by my wife's gynaecologist, who's a woman who treats sort of cabinet ministers and people who work in the public eye. And I said to her, have you thought of becoming a GP? And she said, I say as some vets say, I prefer to deal with thoroughbreds. <laughs> that was the story, anyway. And I'm not a male chauvinist pig, I'm a male chauvinist dove. <laughs> and I think we tend to underestimate women, particularly in those fields where men would wish to predominate. Like like driving a car. I mean, it's, it's impossible to acknowledge that your wife is more than, on a good day, an adequate driver. <laughs> but to, to admit that your wife can drive better than you is not in nature. <laughs> About eight years ago, in Thorpe, now, I don't know whether you remember, but before the M25, you could go from Thorpe, past the Old Mill restaurant, over St Anne's Hill, Windy Hill, and drop down easily into Chertsey. Now, I was doing this, and I was thinking driving. You know, where you, where you let the, the mind tick over. And it's not that sort of furious, competitive, getting home driving or anything like that. I was driving well within the, the speed limit, about 28 miles an hour. And driving round these bins onto St Anne's Hill with a mind ticking over and some great problem, technical problem, 
Round the corner, towards me, is this woman in this clapped out, black, I remember it to this day, Mois 1100, dense all over it, misses my wing, the Lagonda, by... <laughs> <clears throat> misses it by a thou, winds down the window and shouts, PIG! and drives on. I... I thought, women drivers drove round the bend and hit a pig. So I said to Mr. Statham, I don't want to do an after-dinner speech <laughs> for reasons as stated. And the pips were going like small arms fire. And he said, well, say a little something about yourself. Uh, tell them a joke. See if they want to ask any questions. And for God's sake, and then the phone went dead. <laughs> So I, I thought I'd, I thought that's pretty good advice, really. Did you think, sir? So I, I thought I'd tell you a little about myself. Not a lot, in case the magic goes. <laughs> Why do you know that's from Protestant? I'm a uh, well, sort of Protestant. I, I'm married to Catholic. I've got Catholic children. I've got a sister-in-law who's a reverend mother at a convent at Ascot. And I'm a lapsed agnostic. <laughs> My doubts are beginning to waver. <clears throat> I'm quite old, but incredibly well preserved. <clears throat> I spent... I spent 35 years... Oh, I'm 63 on the plane going home on Saturday. Nice thought, isn't it? If we get there, I suppose if we... I'm not sure about the time. Oh, God, I have to work it out. I can never work it out. Perhaps I'm 64 if we go the other way around. <laughs> Some of the distilled wisdom of my 62.9 years. If you get an, a map of southern England, a pencil and a ruler and join up Oxford, Cambridge and Croydon, it makes an equilateral triangle. <laughs> King George III never saw the sea until he was aged 38. Never rest a warm baby on a cold slab. <laughs> Wire coat hangers, if left in the darkness of a wardrobe, breed. <laughs> I thought that was rather brilliant. I'm glad I found it, anyway. I not waste it. I had hoped, incidentally, that I would... I might have been honoured before I'd seemed to be knighted. But I wasn't able to achieve this. In fact, I blotted my copybook so successfully that I will never be knighted. It was a year or two back when Prince Charles made his inaugural speech in the House of Lords. I got back after recording of my word on my music just in time for the 10 o'clock ITV news. This afternoon, in the House of Lords, Prince Charles made his maiden speech. They reported he opened his speech by saying, as Oscar Wilde said, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. And I thought, now hang on. <laughs> That's not Oscar Wilde. It's G.K. Chesterton. And it, it is terribly important, if you're going to quote it, to get it right. Because if it's Oscar Wilde, it's just a Wildean, witty inversion. 
But it's not that, you see. It's a philosophy, and to me, a very important one. If a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing even though you don't win. It's worth doing because you enjoy doing it. It's the reason we carry on playing tennis. You know, it's... It's, <laughs> it's the reason we carry on playing golf. And it's, it's a very pernicious modern teaching that there's a, the winner takes all. They don't. The thing to do, if your children um, are not very good at their uh, passing exams, what does it matter? What matters is they get a little better at what they do and they enjoy doing it. So that even though they do it badly, it's worth doing because they're enjoying it. So I got very steamed up being tired. Not tired and emotional, just tired. <laughs> Uh, and like a fool, I rang the Times Diary, well, it's the duty officer, and asked him to pass the message down, just pointing out that it wasn't Oscar Wilde who said everything, it, it was UK Chesterton. The following morning, Times, lead story, Prince Charles main speech, tell me. Prince Charles started, as Oscar Wilde said, things worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Asterisk. Right at the bottom of the page, huge black type, Mr. Frank Muir <laughs> pointed out last night that this was a misquotation by Prince Charles. <laughs> Full stop. Gets worse. Months pass. Pages flick from the calendar to indicate passage of time. <clears throat> I'm doing a, a hated after-dinner thingy for the Wildlife Fund and also speaking, is Prince Philip. <laughs> so, I find myself next to the Duke, and for something to say, he said, um, oh, sir, um, I must apologize for correcting Prince Charles. And then I, I bored Prince Philip, his eyes were going glazed. <laughs> as I explained why Chesterton was the philosopher. And I ended up, anyway, I would have thought that the the idiot who gave him the quotation would have the nouse to look it up. <laughs> he said, I gave him the quotation. <laughs> so it's peasant Frank, I'm afraid. <laughs> Muir's 1983 performance in Hong Kong wasn't ever intended for broadcast, but fortunately, it did get recorded. Fortunately, because the tape demonstrates so many of the qualities that formed Frank's unique talent. There's his love of the English language and the exactness with which he deployed it. There's his taste for puns and anecdotes, his wonderful instinct for timing. Above all, there's Frank's benign personality, which made the world a better place for his presence in it. Here, sadly in his absence, is part two of that Hong Kong tape. I learned the power of comedy when I was at school. I, I was born and brought up in Ramsgate. I went to a, a, a sort of very junior prep school sort of thing. Uh, this is in 1926 or 1927. It was run, in fact, the sole teacher was a figure who looked like Hindenburg, <laughs> <coughs> whose name was Miss Rule. <laughs> she was... I was talking in the class, and I was made to stand up and repeat what I said. And I remember what I said. I said, this is a ter terribly unfunny line. I said, this pencil top is Miss Rule's bum. Not a line you might consider on which to base a career. <laughs> but the warm approbation I received from my fellow Moppets was such, I was whacked for it, was such that um, I, it was my first tingle that if you make, if you make the others laugh, you, uh, you're okay, you, you exist. You know, you're not totally worthless. And I first started writing, uh, not professionally, but 
seriously, funnily. During the war, it was in Iceland. I was posted to Iceland in 1942. I was previously at an uh, RAF station called Wormwell. Wormwell, Wormwell. I was a photographer. And at Wormwell, they had um, a tremendous number of huge, heavy, grey, steel aerial cameras and no aircraft. So time hung heavy. <laughs> and I wrote a play, which I lost. But anyway, time passed. Now I was posted in 1942 to Reykjavik, to Kaldadanes actually, just outside Reykjavik in Iceland, with a, a tremendous number of aircraft and no cameras. <laughs> and, and time hung heavy. <laughs> And I found that there's a troops radio station. So I got involved with that because nothing else to do. And I, I wrote things and, and broadcast. And it was, it was a place to be lousy in. Uh, you know, before, with a bit of luck, it got a bit better. And it was tremendously valuable. But the impact of it uh, came upon me when we were driving back to Caledonis after doing a show in a 1500 weight comma truck. And there were five of us. And the truck overturned. It wasn't a bad thing because the driver couldn't go fast, but he skidded into a ditch thing and the, the comma truck overturned. And we got out, out without any difficulty and I walked to a farmhouse and rang up the duty officer and said, Aircraftsman First Class Muir reporting, sir. The commas come to a full stop. <laughs> I, I, I got arrested. Uh, for, for speaking to an officer in an unairman like manner. And I was uh, wheeled in in front of the commanding officer. He wore First World War Royal Flying Corps jodhpurs and a pistol in a holster. He used to fly the tiger moth, the station of tiger moth. He used to take it off and turn it over and fly it upside down over the runway until the petrol ran out. <laughs> he was, he was, and, and he said, um, Reykjavik, why? So I said, uh, I was um, broadcasting, sir. Oh, uh, um, you are um, Reykjavik. Uh, he, he spoke like Tarzan. <laughs> and I, and I realized that he had a very limited vocabulary. He probably got through life on about 150 words. <laughs> and if you subtract, pass the marmalade, and, and, and does the 1210 stop at Camberley, you're not left with much to work on. <laughs> Why? I said, uh, radio, sir. What? Why, radio? What? What, 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 what do you do? What? So I said, um, I, I talk, you see. Um, I talk about things, and he went, talk, radio, and I said, yes, and he looked at me with awe, and he said, Sergeant, promote this man. <laughs> since, since when, I've, I've looked forward, but not upwards much, and I've, I've been pottering along with the stuff uh, ever since. I started in, uh, when I was still in uniform, writing things, and sent them in to Ted Kavanagh. He was a marvellous man, kind of saintly man he was, who wrote Itmar. He started a, a, a kind of agency for writers, and I sent him stuff, and he liked it and helped me get started. Which was very happy, because about that time I met Dennis Snorden, about whom I'm going to say very little, because it's almost impossible to, as it were, discuss your right arm, or the better part of your brain. And we worked together for 35 years without as much as a sour glance I'm not sure that this betokens anything more than the fact that it requires expenditure of nervous energy to have rows. And none of us has any to spare. <laughs> or any at all, come to think of it. But we, we've worked um, so happily and we, we wrote everything together for 20... We used to write... Take it, we wrote a show called Take It From Here. Is anybody elderly enough to remember? <laughs> oh, it was pre-recording, it was before recordings. So it was live. We used to record the show on the Sunday. We did this for years. We would start writing the next script on the Monday, 
And we'd write the last spot first, which was a sort of pastiche of Jane Austen or a film or a book or something. Then we wrote the middle spot, which was the glums, from Tuesday lunchtime until Wednesday night. Then Thursday morning, we used to write the opening spot, which was a bit of topical patter between the three of them as themselves. And then Thursday afternoon, we used to read it to the producer, who was implacable. He held to his point of view, was incorruptible, and quite frequently right. <laughs> and when he retired, and we had producers who were not like that, who didn't hold rigid views and were flexible and liberal, my God, we felt lost. Because we knew how to battle with Charles, you see. He was, he was terribly against any kind of smut. Oh, couldn't bear smut. Now, it is the duty of comedy writers to probe the very perimeters of permitted squalid bad taste. <laughs> That is our duty. And to get it past Charles, any whiff of it, you had to, you had to invent stratagems. We, what, a favourite one of ours was, if we wanted to get something, was a bit edgy. I remember we did a thing on uh, the Winslow boy, and Dick Bentley played the Winslow boy, and when he was in the dock in the last scene, and Jimmy Edwards, as the judge, said, how do you plead? <laughs> not, not, not guilty, sir. And you may have said, well, you are a miserable little pleader, aren't you? <laughs> In the 1950s, that was hot stuff. <laughs> How to get it past Charles on Thursday afternoon. So we had something absolutely vile in. Something about a, a French... Egyptian girl with nine bosoms called Nefertiti. <laughs> I just, I can't say that. You can't say that. You see, and on the next page, he had the miserable pleader coming up. You see, we knew we couldn't say Nefertiti. So we sat and argued with him. Charles, Charles, these are the 1950s. The world's changing, you know. And eventually say, OK, we'll take it out. And he took it out. So when he came to the miserable plea, he just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible thing. And then on Friday, we wrote another show entirely called Bedtime with Braden. And on Saturday, we had off with our wives and families. And on Sunday, we went up to London and recorded the show and started the next one on the Monday. It was, it was that kind of regime. I, for... for a great number of years, I, I used to write comedy, scripts and things, and, uh, and now I write books. For the last ten years, I've been writing books. I've, after so many years writing fiction, I got very fascinated with non-fiction humour, as it were. The funny things that actually happened, and, and I've got a new one out now, on the social history of the bathroom and its concomitant activities. <laughs> Did you know that before loo paper... Is it, oh, what a depressing subject. Before, before loo paper, people used to use scrapers. In America, they use the corn cob. Which is it's quite, it's quite... They still do in the, in the rural areas. And in Europe, right through until the 19th century, the favourite device was readily obtainable everywhere, and it was a mussel shell. Was, I've also found a nice story. I was never able to trace it back, but it is an absolutely true story, or if not true, a lie, <laughs> concerning, <coughs> concerning the Jersey Lily, Lily Langtree, who was dining at Lord Derby's, having the weekend at a country party at Lord Derby's uh, estate. And Lord Derby, who was a sporting chap, and she was a sporting lady, asked her, asked her whether she would, if he filled the bath in the guest wing with a light but sound hock, whether she would bath in it in front of he and his male guests on the Saturday evening. And very sportingly, she agreed. So, they all filed in with their 
white tie and tails and cigars and paunches and observe this enchanting little creature who with many a girlish shriek cavorted in the pale transparent hock and they watched her busy with her thoughts <laughs> and eventually they filed out again like like a row of railway engines puffing smoke as tomorrow was Sunday, my lord told his butler to re-bottle the hock <coughs> and serve it with a salmon mousse as a little tribute to a very sporting lady, which they did. And it was much enjoyed, very good luncheon. And afterwards, the butler tugged at his lordship's sleeve and asked for a word. He said, curious, my lord, whereas I poured into the bath... And a half bottles. <laughs> so, you see, before, we, before you were a writer, with little experience in life and much else, one of the perils of uh, writing books is that um, it's no longer quite as gentlemanly an occupation as it used to be, uh, because they, the writing is bad enough. It's the most lonely, boring job in the world to sit alone in a room and write. What is marvellous is to have written when Chaucer finished Troilus and Chrysid, you will recall. <laughs> he wrote in it, go, little book. And it was wonderful. You know, he'd done his work, the printer, the binder had done their, his. And nowadays, of course, it's, um, it's got to such a state that it, it's... Go, little book, but hang on, I'm coming with you. <laughs> if, if, like mine, your, your publishers get a bit frantic about getting the sales into double figures before the year's out. <laughs> <coughs> Author tours. Uh, it's not so bad in England, uh, where the distances are short and you can get home to sanity at the weekends, but even then the signing sessions where you sit there unhappily waiting for something to happen. There's a shop called, a big successful shop called Hudson's in Birmingham, which is two old Georgian houses closed together, so it's all tiny little rooms. And I'm stuck up there in between theology and gardening. <laughs> With a desk like this, with piles of books, nobody, nobody. And people, people want to pass and say, do you do Christmas cards? And they say, no, no. And my only, tr my triumph at Hudson's was signing. Because a woman shot past, bent, and, and like a cartoon character, went off screen and then reversed. And said, I know you, it's, um, oh, ah, it's, uh, you're on, um, aren't you? Yeah. And, she, and she said, um, I, could I have your autograph? And she said, I haven't got anything. I, I, I can't afford books, love, you know. So I haven't got anything. I, I, and she ruffled in her shopping and bought out half a pound of anchor butter. <laughs> which I signed with a ballpoint pen. <laughs> it, it didn't work. You know, it, it just got indented. She could have taken a mould from it, I suppose. I had a little gold tablet. There was another one I was signing. Again, it wasn't a book. It was going to be slips of paper, you know. And the woman said to me, could you for my daughter? And this, this bit, it was a bit of Kleenex. I've never tried signing on Kleenex. But it sort of doesn't fight the nib. It goes with it. And, then, and you, you try holding it... And, and she said, would you for my daughter? She's only tiny, but she's, she's a great fan. She watches you every week and looks familiar. So I said, no, I'm call my bluff. You've got the wrong one. It's Dennis Norden you want. She said, that's right, Dennis Norden. I said, but I'm Frank Muir. And she said, oh. She said, well, carry on signing love. She can't read anyway. <laughs> it sort of sums it up, doesn't it? The problem in America was partly taxes 
And when, when you first go, you've got to identify how you get the taxi in that particular city. I mean, is it one like New York, where you stand on the edge? And the eighth empty one stops and says, where you want to go? And you say, uh, 43rd Street. And he says, nah, and drives on. <laughs> and he says, in America, in New York, all the taxis are yellow and dented. And most of the space previously taken up by the passenger, the fee payer, is now taken up by a steel grill to prevent malcontents from bopping the driver on the head and stealing his wad. So, if you're over four foot two, which I am, you, ha you have to get into a fetal crouch on the back seat. But then it gets worse because he talks to you. There's just room to get down, to get down onto the coconut matting against that and there's a little window there it's for putting your money through you see when you when you get there and you find yourself talking to him as though you're in some sort of weird mobile confessional <laughs> I was in Australia and I met there an example of Melbourne cabbie's wit we were in the hotel in Melbourne, and I was going to be filmed for the news, which is a measure of the sort of news they have there. <laughs> Not a measure of my star quality. And it was, it was nine o'clock, the, uh, the interview, nine o'clock in the morning, and at 9.30 I had to be in st station XRANA, I don't know. All commercial radio stations throughout the world are anagrams of the word anthrax. <laughs> it, was, it was one of the W... <clears throat> I was due to go there, and he said, uh, Down be light, it's live show. And, and he said, you know what sort of station we are? We're hard rock and current affairs. <laughs> But anyway, I had to go on to hard rock and current affairs and have this interview with this... So I, I was there at nine, no presenter, no interviewer. Waited, quarter past nine, twenty past nine, no interviewer. So I rush out, there's a little cab rank outside. I got to the first one, there's a lovely plump old boy, you know, and I said, could you wait for me because I've got to go to the station X and A. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll be here, I'll be here. Half past nine, just after half past nine, meh, tires, out leaps this young fellow, suit soaking wet from the knees down, absolutely wringing his shoes and socks. He apologises and says that he's, he, he, where he lives there's a culvert between that and the, it's raining up in the mountains and he'd had to wade through the water. Violin-faced technician jacked the camera up a notch to avoid the wet. Welcome to Australia. Why'd you write the book, Mr. You know, the usual interview. Three minutes, finished it. Dash out. <sighs> Go to the cup. Station XNA. Okay, stop it. And the way, when you've held somebody up, you sort of rather, rather nervously explain what happened. You know, I'm, I'm frightfully sorry, but um, the, uh, what happened was the um, chap who's due to interview me was held up. And when he arrived, his trousers were soaking wet from the knees down. He said, comes a try to pee and buy focals. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't... <laughs> the one... Well, now, um, as I said, I, I, I say a bit about myself uh, and then and then tell you a joke, and, and, and that's it. I was terribly worried about the sort of joke that you'd enjoy. What's a funny joke? A funny joke is a joke that people laugh at. And a good joke is a joke which is good because it's properly chosen to suit the occasion. I mean, it's got to suit the hall, as it were, and it's got to suit you, and I had never seen you before tonight. Now that I have, it's... 
all these elements are what makes a joke successful because it, it is apt for that specific occasion. And this worried me enormously before coming out here. There are all sorts of good jokes, but to find the right one... And I was worried, and my daughter's got a moped, and uh, she's got a puncture. It's extremely rare these days, isn't it, punctures and cars and things? But she had a puncture in the moped tyre, and I said, leave it to me. I'll do it. I, I remembered the old days of bicycle, so I got a couple of the best spoons, you know, to, to, get, to get the rim of and went to the garage to search for the puncture outfit and eventually found it. We were lying for years. Oh, that dear, beloved rectangular tin with the round ends. <laughs> and then I got it open eventually. And it's full of these wonders, these delights. There was an albino match. <laughs> and there was, there was a... A teeny, tiny, teeny fairy cheese grater. <laughs> and there's some strips, uh, some strips of ready brown cardboard. And there was a wooden tube. <laughs> it was sort of metal, but when you, when you felt it, it didn't dent. You know? So I took the top of this off, and I was squeezing this and it can't be wood it must have had stuff in it originally and I was squeezing away and worrying about the joke to tell you and suddenly the solution hit me right between the eyes <laughs> when I sh <laughs> what I should do is tell you a joke that I like then it's an honest thing you, if you don't like it okay you can hate me but it doesn't have to suit you, so I haven't let you down. I've just sort of told you a little bit more about myself. Because the thing about jokes is that they, they are the surest indication of the teller. You laugh sometimes, quite frequently, at people of power to bring them down in size. So the English make jokes about the Irish. This is a... No, they're not so good. And the Americans make jokes about their ethnic minorities, so they're not, uh, not so fearful. You also, you also laugh at what worries you. Not what you dread, but what worries you. Again, because if you, can, if you laugh at it, it absolves you from the responsibility of doing anything about it, for one thing. You, you try that next time somebody tells you a joke. I must tell you a joke. There's something in that that appeals to him, which reveals an aspect of his character. Not necessarily a bad aspect at all, but certainly reflects him. Extraordinary. Which, which I'm about to do now, you see, with this joke. It's not a big joke. <laughs> it's not a sort of massive... In fact, it's really, a, it's really a very, very tiny joke. And it's a joke in which I am rapidly losing confidence. <laughs> The only, thing, the only thing good about it is it will release you from this bondage and end this little evening with you. It seems, I, just there, to indicate the joke had started, you know. The, <laughs> it seems that there's this uh, man who had to go into hospital to have a... It had to have an abdominal, lower abdominal operation, a small one. And he was... He was a member of one of those insurance groups. So he, he got a private room at University College Hospital, arrived at the correct time, and as instructed on the wall in English and Arabic, Arabic first, <laughs> he, <coughs> he took all his clothes off, covered himself partly with a towel, and lay down on this hardish kind of bed thing. And after about an hour, <laughs> there was a knock on the door. Come in, he said. And the nurse came in. And she said, I've come to prepare you for the operation. So she whisked, whisked the towel off, <laughs> then went over to the sink <laughs> and came over and shaved him relevantly. And then, uh, and she got a bottle and, and she dabbed him with an 
unbelievably painful <laughs> fluid <laughs> over the scraped flesh. <laughs> and then she made him stand up. <laughs> then she made him walk forward and into a back-to-front green dressing gown, <laughs> which she did up at the back. And then she said, before I take you into surgery, is there anything you'd like to know? And he said, yes, there is. Why did you not 